Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, I am Rajesh Isan Gupta and we will be continuing on the first module and the first week on uh, clay, terracotta and terra cruda. So this is the last installment of the lectures that we already have uh, been continuing on. So today we will start our discussion on um, some of the metal objects uh, as opposed to the clay and terracotta ones. But I mean as we have already discussed this uh, fantastic bronze casted image that is this dancing woman or a girl and um, that, that one that had uh, such high significance in terms of understanding the various aspects of Indian art in terms of its technique, in terms of its use of material and then of course this fantastic balance that this tiny image displays. So taking those ideas further, we will be talking slightly more on the use of metals. So in terms of the use of metals, we find that I mean this is uh, this is the time, the mature phase of the Harappan, um, uh, you know, Harappan civilization, which is 2600 BC to 1900 BC. Around this time, this time is also considered to be the bronze age in this area. And so by this time we see that the people have already uh, learned the ways in which to make this highly specialized alloy that is bronze which is made from copper, tin and in some cases there are other materials which are also involved in it. So the proportion of them and how to uh, make them for the uh, desired um, you know uh, the, the desired consistency as well as the quality quality of the material, all those things have been learned by these people uh, in the second and third millennium BC in these Indus Valley sites. And then we also see that how those things were not really been only implemented in bronze casting but also for making different kind of objects. So here we have two different kind of objects which are displayed on our uh, slides and that is the first one on the left side we have bangles. So in the, if you can remember in those terracotta figurines and the seals, we have prominence of bangles and different kind of ornaments. If you remember that we had some fairly complicated ornaments such as those fan shaped um, headdress and then those elaborate choker and necklaces. In some cases we can find that I mean there are use of beads and for making beads also we have discussed that how there is a prominence of using iron tools and different kind of metallic tools to shape those stones. And here we also find that there are different kind of metals which are used for making these ornaments. So these ornaments can be worn by, I mean we are not quite sure about the status of this, um, in th of the people who wore these ornaments. However, we can also think about that how uh, some of the simplest of these ornaments are uh, surviving till date alongside the bead ornaments and that says something about the material culture during this time period. So if we see the, the bangles which are there in the left side of the screen, the bangles are fairly simple and they are perhaps been made from a long a bronze um, you know wire or like a um, you know um, a cylindrical um, piece of bronze which was casted first and then it was heated and then after when it, it was slightly uh, malleable and then it was hammered into this particular shape and that is the reason we do not really find that I mean this has been uh, you know this is perfectly circular in shape. However, there are marks of hammering, there are marks of like other tools which are used there that we can find and that says something about the different ways in which the metal was utilized. So in the first uh, example, uh, in the last lecture we have seen how bronze was used as part of this wax, um, uh, lost wax process where 
where the where the model was made of wax and then how bronze was uh, you know uh, used in the mold that was created by uh, this this wax model and here we find there is a different way in which uh, bronze is utilized and that is first this cylindrical or perhaps this uh, long uh, strip or this piece of bronze that was created and and then it was uh, molded and then um, and uh, then it was sort of hammered when it is warm and then it was uh, heated and then uh, made into this shape this desired shape for the bangles so if, if these are the kind of things we find to be incorporated in their practice then there are also some of the other things for example the utilitarian wires the ones we have for example in the right side of the screen so, in the right side of the screen we have a vessel which is perhaps something that is used for cooking or storing food or storing grain and this is a metal vessel and this is something we can also think about it that how there are pottery sh sh shreds which are found from the sides, there are burial pottery which are also found similar kind of shapes we have found in the pottery and now we see the same shape in metal. It might signify different kind of things for example that what kind of different purpose does pottery do what kind of different purpose do uh, you know the metals serve if there is a metal wear so we can also think about that i mean the status of the users that pottery uh, the items can be utilized by people who are much more uh, we can we can think about the regular people who could use pottery but when it comes in terms of this complicated technologies uh, like making bronze and making bell metals and copper and so in those cases we can think that how all those minerals were extracted and then made into the alloy and then those were casted and then of course hammered into making these objects. So it it uh, goes through a much more longer time consuming as well as an expensive procedure for making these objects. So, when these objects are done with more care, more investment and so on, we can also think about their economic value and social value and of course the cultural value will also be different from the pottery items, something we can also imagine for the vessel that we have on screen. So, this vessel which is made from copper even though the color looks much more uh, bronze like but I mean it, it, this is a copper vessel and this copper vessel apparently it was actually made from uh, beating the copper sheets into uh, uh, rectangular flat sheets and then uh, they are sort of like I mean joined together for making this copper vessel and of course I mean beating, hammering and uh, this uh, techniques were much more uh, implemented in this one than the one we have seen for the bangles and of course also for the wax resist process. So, in this one as we can see that I mean since there are various sheets of the copper that was joined together for making this vessel and that is the reason there are some of the marks where we can find the joineries are there. So, that is how the historians, the archaeologists and art historians have came to conclusion that this is something that perhaps been made from beating these copper sheets, putting them together and joining them instead of any other method that had that might have been uh, involved in making this kind of vessels. So, these are the different ways in which we find that how uh, metal is utilized and even though there are very few uh, examples we are left with from the from the Indus Valley sites as compared to the pottery shreds and um, the brick structures, but these are some of the sophisticated use of the metal that also shows something about their material culture. Then talking about the metal must also remember that the exploration of this metal also starts from the earth. So, we have already been speaking about the clay and soils close interrelationship with the earth and um, the idea of the mother earth right. So, in this case as well that understanding the landscape, understanding the demographic, understanding the geographical location and all those things that must have also played a huge role in uh, thinking about how where to find the minerals for extracting copper, where to find minerals for extracting iron and where to find minerals for making 
tin and things like that and then all those things were put together joined and of course that I mean it goes through a much more lengthier procedure than what we can explain in a lecture. So this, this is also something I want to uh, sort of stress that even though we are looking at metal objects but the idea of how they are related to ground, how they are related to earth and how they are related to landscape perhaps these ideas are not discrete from how we see those ideas have played out in terms of the use of clay for making terracotta. So that is how in another way I would say that I mean uh, the idea of the landscape, the idea of localized material as well as the material which have been uh, brought there from other regions. So those things have always played a very important role whether those are terracotta, whether those are bronze or any different kind of metals and so on. From there I would like to draw our attention to some of the interrelationship between these objects and their long term uh, influence on the material culture and uh, belief system in the Indian subcontinent. So we have already spoken about how there are those figurines, the terracotta figurines that we have seen, some of the figurines which have been made from joining two vertical clay strips putting together and making them and which is also which is so um, unusual for which uh, the archaeologists and historians and art historians they have thought that perhaps this is also part of some of their rituals, their belief system and so on and all those images they perhaps been like a lot of those images perhaps been made for ritualistic purpose and why we say that that is because the use of terracotta for making ritualistic images is something that we still see in the Indian subcontinent. And here are some of the examples I have on screen and these are from uh, different locations of the Indian subcontinent and they are also something that we can think about how uh, in the contemporary times this kind of ritualistic practices have been um, continuing. So, in uh, one way we can also think that I mean uh, whether uh, it has this tendency towards generalization that something that had happened in the 20, uh, 2600 BC or 1900 BC can we draw a simplistic relationship between those times and something that we are evidencing right now. But there have been some of the archaeological expeditions and some of the archaeological um, ground breaking work for example Jonathan Mark Neuer and Uzma Rizvi and so on who have brought together some of this kind of methodological approaches where we find that the historical objects, historical practices are brought in conversation with the contemporary ones and that is how we find that the that possibilities and challenges of doing this kind of cross disciplinary work and also breaking the strict idea of chronology to understand something that had been there in the historical past. So, if we see the images that we have on screen, so the image in the left side we have that is from Sankhera and that is um, it is a horse and it is a horse as we can see that I mean this horse is very simplistic and there are um, the degree of simplicity in this that actually draws our attention to, um, to some of the images that we have already studied in the Harappan context, in the Indus Valley context. Uh, so, this is an image that is from Sankhera and it was made in the 1970s in Gujarat and this was a votive item which was uh, used during the Navaratri festival and so we can imagine that I mean this such kind of ritualistic uh, use of these images that we have seen in the earlier times in the 3rd and 2nd millennium BC is something that is still relevant for the Indian uh, population and the Indian societies. So this is uh, another way in which we can imagine that some of the practices for example in terms of the Harappan civilization uh, or the Indus Valley civilization if we think that I mean how those uh, the belief systems we cannot really pin them down to um, a particular religion. Now if we see them being part of like I mean more uh, in the mainstream um, uh, Hindu uh, belief 
as as well as in the tribal belief and in the islamic belief and so on we can imagine that how some of those uh, belief systems which were existing there in the second and third millennium bc they have made their influence on the people in this indian subcontinent across uh, religious backgrounds so that is something for us to think about the larger implication of the harappan material culture so coming back to this horse that i mean what we see here the body of the horse that is actually perhaps been made from this cylindrical uh, uh, drinking cup so the drinking cup is something that we can find to be this hollowed um, you know this pottery um, uh, item and then at the bottom of it the legs are added and the legs are simplistic and they also give stability to this form and so that is also something we can um, you know related to some of the terracotta horse and the other figurines that we have studied in the indus valley context and then on the top of it we also have this very simplistic um, you know uh, projection and this projected area that that signifies the neck and the face of the horse and then two uh, additional um, two additional ears are joined to this section and this additive process that's something that we have studied in the harappan in the indus valley context we can still find their resonance in making this kind of votive items as well as many other terracotta items in the um, you know in the indian subcontinent and then there are very simple marks which are created on this horse for example very simple um, this horizontal marks for creating the eyes and the mouth and then just a hole for signifying the nose the nose trill so these are some of those uh, the visual uh, characteristic features and of course like i mean the characteristics of this horse that we find here they can also relate us uh, they can also relate this kind of practices to something that had happened in the 3rd and 2nd millennium bc now from there i mean we can imagine that how uh, gujarat's geographical location is something that is very significant and because some of the indus valley sites that we have looked at and of course i mean we have not gone in detail about them but some of the indus valley sites the important sites for example dhola vera and lothal they are situated in the present day state of gujarat and so if the kind of this practices of making these votive items in terracotta that we see in this state today it should not come as a surprise that similar kind of uh, practices had been existing in this region for um, for centuries and for millennia perhaps so if this is one of the instances we find that how this practices have uh, progressed further and then the other example comes from the southern state of tamil nadu in tamil nadu we have this gigantic ayanar horses which are made in the eastern part of tamil nadu close to the coromandel coast and then where what we find there are those gigantic horses which are much more sophisticated in their making as well as their ornamentation and then they are also uh, given to this uh, village god and uh, during uh, this one uh, annual festival so this gigantic horses are dedicated to this village god for the well being of the people in this region and something that that we can find its resonance with how we have seen that the small terracotta figurines and so on those were used in uh, different uh, parts of the indian subcontinent as well as their history rooted in the uh, indus valley sites so in the for the ayanar horses what we find that i mean uh, in terms of the making of this terracotta horses that the horses are actually made from different um, you know uh, this the horses are not really made as in a simplistic way as we find the horse from sankhera or from the ones that we have studied from the harappan context and here the horse making is much more complicated in terms of that i mean how the body parts are made separate 
immediately they are then fired and then perhaps they are joined. In some cases we can also find that I mean they were made separately as parts and then they are joined and put in the kiln. So these are the ways in which we find that how those horses are made in a much more sophisticated way. But some of the other characteristic features for example the additive process in terms of adding all the details in these horses for example um, the hair, the ears, the eyes and uh, of course the other ornamentation that we find in the body of the horses they are all done in this same additive process that we find uh, you know in the Indus Valley sites that how this additional ornaments and everything those are pasted on the top of this uh, figures for um, you know for embellishment for giving this um, you know for giving much more this individualist uh, touches to them for us to recognize them as horse and not as elephant or not as rhinoceros. So those kind of tendencies we find to be present uh, on different degrees in the various uh, votive items made of terracotta across the Indian subcontinent. So talking about these votive items and then like I mean the other uses of uh, clay, we have, uh, we have not been uh, addressing this, this one aspect of uh, the, the clay sculptures and the clay images and that is the terra cruda. And terra cruda is something that is made from unbaked clay and we have already discussed in the first uh, lecture uh, the dangers of having terra cruda images and that is because since these are not baked they are not durable, they are much more malleable than the terracotta images. And that is the reason what happens is that the images which are made from terra cruda or unbaked clay, they can be uh, dismantled very easily, they, they can erode very easily. So those are the kind of things that also affects the ritualistic use of these images. So the historians and the archaeologists have found the uh, some of the fragments and the use of mud in the walls and some of the fragmentary images made from mud or from unbaked clay from the Indus Valley sites which made them believe that I mean there were some other rituals which were associated with making unbaked clay items. And some of the rituals that we still see in the uh, Indian subcontinent and not necessarily all Hindu rituals, there we find that the use of unbaked clay is also something very significant. And we have here on screen two contemporary images and um, one is from the, the state of West Bengal uh, from the mangrove region of Sundarbans and here what we find in the image in the left is that there are two deities who are represented that is Bon Bibi and Shah Jongoli. And these two uh, deities are actually uh, revered by the fishermen and the other forest dwellers in the mangrove region of uh, the southern West Bengal. And here both uh, Muslims and Hindus they worship these deities. Uh, so the making of this idol what we find that the idols are made from unbaked clay because baking the clay and with this, this particular kind of rituals that does not really have this idea of life because uh, for making these images first uh, bamboo structures are made on the top of that there are rice husk or rice hay that is um, used for um, you know supporting the bamboo structure and on the top of that layers of clay is added for making these images. And this particular way of making the images that follows also a kind of lifespan of the human beings. The way we have our bone structures on the top of that we have muscles and other veins and things like that and then on the top of that we have our skin. So this is a similar kind of process we find that is followed for making this uh, unbaked clay structures. And the reason for making them unbaked because the body is malleable that I mean our bodies are not really going to exist if we uh, put ourselves into the high temperature or like a fire or a kiln. So that is a similar kind of uh, treatment that is given to this unbaked clay images that the clay images are considered to be uh, living images and that is the reason they are not really put inside a kiln. So they are uh, worshipped 
or they are uh, used for the ritualistic purposes and after the ritual ends they are immersed in water or they are left by the water. So, for the weather conditions and also for uh, how the unbaked clay dissolves in water that is how the clay and other materials which are used in this images they eventually dissolve and they disappear uh, leaving only the structure of the images the bamboo structure and the hay structure. So, this is this is also a symbolism that is very much important we can think about in terms of understanding life that how life is also like that, that there is this cyclical process in which something starts, it continues, it transforms and after a point it also disappears and then the new life starts. So, this idea of recycle, it is something and the, this rebirth, the cycle of birth and rebirth, these are some of the ideas that we find to be associated with the use of unbaked clay. And when we map this kind of observations and experiences onto uh, something that we have studied in the Indus Valley context, we can think that I mean how life, death and all these ideas might have also played out an uh, important role for them to make. Uh, clay made images as well. And there are uh, reasons for us to believe that I mean they also had this um, much more complicated and complex ideas about life and death and that is because that they had already been thinking in terms of how the terracotta images are made and the particular use of that bone pigment that, that we have already discussed. So, those are the kind of things that also make us think that it will probably not be unusual for them to also know about the use of unbaked clay for this kind of purposes. So, from there I would just like to wrap up this session and uh, remind us about some of the aspects of this Indus Valley um, civilization. So, we have looked into a number of objects and number of sites. For example, we have in the further left side of the screen the city, um, you know the ruins of the city and this stupa like structure which we have discussed that it is perhaps perhaps uh, a, a site of um, any kind of demonstration or public assembly and so on. We have also looked into some of those structures like the public bath and then the remains of the well, remains of furnace and things like that that tell us about this highly sophisticated and complicated uh, you know the city, the cities which have developed across this Indus Valley. And then uh, we, that also tells us about this very highly sophisticated drainage system, the roads and then like the protection of the cities, irrigation which will be used for um, you know which will be used for agriculture and so on. And then we also have some of the other things for example, uh, the ritualistic images and I think we have spoken a lot about the ritualistic images. So, I would not be um, repeating that, but that also relates us to some of the other things for example, the seals which are very much part of the trade systems and the trade networks which uh, was uh, integral to the development and prosperity of this Indus Valley sites. And here we have a seal where there are those three animal heads related to this one body where we have uh, where we have discussed that I mean this kind of features in these animals is something that we will also find in the later times in Indian art how uh, two bodies are connected to one head or like one body is connected to three heads and this this ingenious you know technique of representing the animal bodies and so on. And from there we have also looked into some of the other uh, use of clay and where the bronze uh, casting is concerned because how we have looked into the lost wax process in which the uh, wax models were made and then those were um, uh, you know made into the molds of mud and then the mud was fired so that the terracotta molds were made onto which 
the bronze was casted and uh, images like this dancing woman and so on were created. So, these are different ways in which we can find how this uh, the material clay was utilized and not only just for making different kind of objects, but how those were also very much part of their belief system, their livelihood as well as their um, you know the trade networks and culture in general. Thank you.